It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. Yeah, I'm excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Shane Gibson, an author, speaker, sales trainer, and expert on social selling. You know, there's been a lot written in the last couple of years about social selling, and yet it's a subject that still seems to be misunderstood by many companies. Like, you know, they ask themselves a question, how am I going to use social selling to develop and close new business? And that's really the key question that many sales leaders have. Now, my guest today, Shane Gibson, is an expert in social selling, as I said before, an expert in how to use it to grow your business. He's going to help us sort out what you need to do to get started to integrate social selling into your sales process. So, Shane, welcome to the show. Hey, awesome to be here. Thank you. So, just take a minute, expand on my introduction, tell people about yourself. Sure. Uh, my background is in is sales training initially, so I, I didn't kind of wake up one day and say, hey, I'd, I'd like to be an expert in this social media stuff. In fact, I've been doing sales training as a family business, actually started out with uh, over 20 years ago. And then when I uh, was moved back to Canada, I was in South Africa for a while uh, doing business there. And I moved back to Canada to open my sales training business here. Um, I had less than the money I have in my pocket right now to launch that business. And so I leveraged the internet and personal networking. And then along came blogging and podcasting uh, a couple of years later. And this would have been now a decade ago. And then all of a sudden, I went from you know using it to generate my own business to ask, have my clients asking me, look, it's great that you've told us how to close and how to reach decision makers and handle handle objections and all that great stuff, but we want to learn how to use the internet like you are to develop more business, build relationships with clients. So I kind of stumbled into it through a lot of my sales training clients. And then back in 2009, 2010, I wrote two books. One book called Sociable with Stephen Jagger. Uh, who's no, the, very good book, by the way. I've read that. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, and it, we loved. We had a lot of fun writing that. And then the other book uh, was in 2010. I wrote with Jay Conrad Levinson on guerrilla social media marketing. And kind of what happened at that point is my two worlds collided. My social media world and my sales world converged, and there became this niche or this massive demand actually to help sales organizations really effectively use social media and social networking. Uh, for sales, all aspects of sales and customer engagement. So that's kind of how I sort of organically fell into this place. And uh, it's pretty exciting to see, literally in the last couple of years, I'm sure as you, you witnessed and seen, is just it explode as, as a discipline that the technologies available are very exciting. And the adoption of even kind of old school companies that I'm really surprised to see using it um, are using it well. So I, I think there's a we're really at this sort of this the the sunrise aspect of this whole trend of social selling. So, well, let's get down to the basics on that then. So, give us your definition of social selling because I think as many people as there are in the audience, they probably have a different conception individually of what social selling is. So, to you, what is it? Oh boy, um, social selling. Let's kind of break up these two aspects. I believe that sales is about creating an environment where an act of faith can take place. So that's what sales is. It's about creating an environment where an act of faith can take place. And social, when referring to social media and social networks, the word social implies two-directional or bi-directional communications, interaction, dialogue, networking, communications. And so I think that social sales is about utilizing social networks to have two-way conversations with our community, build relationships, so we can create an environment where an act of faith can take place. And I think this is where social media is much misunderstood, has been since the dawn of social media, even with marketers, is they think that it's a soapbox that you get on and you yell louder than your competitors. And I think a lot of salespeople see it as that, or, or channel the spam people. Yet it is about creating dialogue and connecting and really establishing yourself as a thought leader in your vertical. But the, the idea of establishing yourself as a thought leader perhaps plays to some of those fears people have about it just being a, a soapbox, right? Yelling louder than other people. Sure. Well, thought leadership, uh, I look at thought leadership as three key disciplines. Um, uh, first piece is, number one, you're creating content and curating content. 
that resonates specifically with your market. So it typically is going to help them either reach their goals faster, more efficiently, better, or it's going to help them solve a pain. So that's the first step, content creation, which could be seen as yelling, but you know, if you're doing it well and it resonates with somebody and it's relevant, then it's okay. Then the next piece is building community. So that is about networking, expanding your network, um, actually helping other people out with your online voice um, in a positive way. And then the third piece is uh, conversation, having relevant conversation and dialogue around your area of expertise online. So that's kind of your three steps or three pieces that relate to thought leadership. And if you do this well, you can create a magnetic brand that people, because you've built a community around yourself, usually are in a certain specific discipline, uh, plus you've had great conversations, established rapport, and your content's relevant, you're not at all yelling to people. In fact, you're seen as a resource and an influential hub to help them with their business or their community. So I think that you know that's how I define, uh, not as much define thought leadership, but that's how I see it happening as a process. And you don't have to write, you don't have to even be a blogger to be a thought leader in sales. You just have to be good at curating great content and insights and sharing it with your network. All right, right? so let's, yeah, let's, let's delve into that because you published an article recently called the nine C's of social selling success. And I thought it'd be fun to, to run through those for the people to show because it's, it's you know, sort of a good soup to nuts list of, of things to be conscious of as you, you know, develop your social sales uh, program. So absolutely. The, so the first, the first C was, is curiosity. Absolutely. So explain what you mean. How does that play into social selling success? I believe that uh, number one is social selling. Um, it's changing constantly, right? As a landscape, uh, sales in general is. But you know, there's new technologies, new ways to reach your demographic. Um, what worked last week might not work this week. Um, it's just a sense of curiosity about how do I adapt? You know, how could I do this better? What's the latest tool I could use that would give me the advantage? But and also, well, how do, how do how do people educate themselves about and keep abreast of what's new? I mean. You know, you're coming into it sort of cold. You're looking at the marketplace. I'm, yeah, I know Twitter. I know LinkedIn. I know Facebook. But yeah, as you said, there are new tools coming out beyond just sort of the, the staples. How do people educate themselves? What's a good first step to educate themselves about what's out there? Well, not to self-promote too much, but my podcast is a great one as well. <laughs> well, that's fine. But, so what's, but, what's the name of your podcast? Uh, it's just called the uh, Social Sales Podcast. And you can find it on iTunes if you type in Shane Gibson Podcast. It's in there. Uh, you can go to closingbigger.net and find it. And I've got 70 free episodes listed right now on iTunes that will tell, talk to you and share with you about social media and, and sales and how they intersect. Um, but beyond just plugging my own stuff, I would say, yes, go reach out and find some good thought leaders in the space around social selling. Do you People have recommendations? Like, uh, Coca Sexton is a, mm -hmm. is a really great one uh, with LinkedIn. Um, you and know, for, I, and I, for people listening, that's K O K A S E X T O N S Coca Sexton of LinkedIn. Uh, yes. I, th I find that nimble. It's a social CRM company, but they share great content on a regular basis on the cutting edge of social selling, and they got a great blog. So I follow their blog uh, extensively. Um, those are you know two big ones for me. Um, I also uh, quite enjoy um, uh, Kite Desk. Kite Desk is another CRM mm -hmm. tool, and their mm -hmm. CEO, which I'm trying to remember his Sean, name, Sean Burke. Yeah, thank you. He shares a ton of good content as well. So I find that you know, with, between those guys, you can start to really dig in and find some some great insight insights on uh, on social selling. Um, for me, I, I you know, a lot of this stuff is free, which is great. So it's self education. LinkedIn has some great tutorials on using social media um, and LinkedIn in particular uh, for your sales process. Tons of free white papers and videos and webinars. So the content's out there. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's really about, you know, if you get two or three, you get on two or three of their lists, uh, Jill Conrath has some great stuff as well. Um, so these are all people that, you know, some great content, but curiosity too, is just, it's a great, and I want to get back to this, it's not just about social selling, it's a great sales attribute. Is it, you can't really, I find it's difficult to teach curiosity, but if I was recruiting salespeople, I'd want a curious salesperson. This says, I wonder who, um, you know, 
uh, is in charge if you're in fleet sales, who's in charge of purchasing those the fleet of vehicles I just saw go by? Or I wonder what innovative way or who I knew in my network who could introduce me to this guy. Or mm-hmm, I, wonder, mm-hmm. I wonder if there's a tool that would help me drill down into Twitter with a specific hashtag and find out who the biggest influencers were on that topic and connect with them. And this is like that sense of curiosity, um, you know, the willingness to stay up late at night and, and kind of uh, toil and tool and play with. Um, your sales process makes you an exceptional salesperson, regardless if you're social selling or just selling in general. True, true. Yeah, another, and just to finish off on this topic, I mean, another resource I think that is a real stimulant to curiosity for people interested in social media is the uh, Social Media Examiner, you know, a daily blog uh, published by a gentleman named Michael Stelzner. So if you go to socialmediaexaminer.com, you're going to read... Great all media. all great sorts of great. case studies about new tools and how people are using them. And if that doesn't get you curious and interested in thinking, okay, how can I apply some of this to my business? Then you, know, you need to check your pulse to make sure you're alive because it's it's a great a great stimulant for things. So, Absolutely. So you start talking about the second CRA, the curation part of it. Yes. And what you're saying is that sharing content is really important if you're a sales rep and that you really have to think about your own thought leadership platform as an individual. This is a little bit of a daunting, uh, I think, proposition for a lot of sales reps to think about, gosh, I need to be finding information that I can share with my customers because it demonstrates that perhaps I myself have some value to add to you, Mr. Customer. And I think it's, a, I think it's daunting to think that um, salespeople aren't educating themselves daily on their industry. Because that means you're becoming less and less relevant to the marketplace, and you're you're getting behind uh, your competitors and people who are studying every day your industry. Well, that's a key. So, that's a really a key point for people to understand, and that you know, I think it's worth worth repeating is that you know your job as a salesperson is to stay relevant to your customer, right? If you're not relevant, then they have no use for you. You know, if you and, can't deliver value to them. So, as you said, one of the real key ways you sort of exemplify that is that you do reading and learning within your own industry. Let's say you sell financial services products, then you should be following bloggers or people on Twitter that are sharing content about your industry and the customers you serve. And, you know, a couple of times a day, see something interesting and retweet it, share it through your network. Retweet it, share it, grab it, take, uh, you know, even on your own I mean, somebody says, well, I can't blog. I'm not really a thought leader, but what if you took and on your LinkedIn, on LinkedIn Pulse, you can actually create blog posts on your own LinkedIn profile, and you picked the top 10, um, you know, industry resources of the week, and it just went out every Friday or every Monday morning, um, and you posted on your network, and then you shared it with your key connections, and you, you did a lot of work for these senior executives that you want to sell to, for instance, where now they don't have to dig through the internet and do a bunch of research to find out the breaking news and the best industry insights, you're seen as the guy who's educated on it, who reads the type of stuff they find valuable. And the minute you, curation will also take you from being a product peddler to actually like a resource, uh, a business peer who discusses the same topics and challenges that these business people that you want to do business with um, are interested in. Yeah, well basically you're, you're training them that you're a source of value. And so this is, people say, well, can't people just Google? Well, if you Google something, you'll know that you'll have 32 posts that come up and they'll all be somewhat conflicting. And who's right? Well, if you can establish yourself as a really great content curator, not necessarily even a blogger, but just a great sales professional who knows your industry, who can be trusted to share really good industry information, then it begins, people have more time for you. The other benefit is just simply the social signals. So what I mean by that is when you log into LinkedIn, the first thing you see is the home feed. And the home feed is the most recent updates or posts from the people in your network. Well, if you're posting once or twice a day valuable information, anybody in your network who's logging on, there's a great chance that they're at least going to see your smiling face on your avatar and the headline. They might not even read it, but just that little act of seeing your face and seeing that you're engaged in the community on a regular basis, that frequency really creates a mind share, which eventually builds wallet share. Well, and exactly. And so let's say you're calling on a prospect for the first time and it's a high value prospect. And the first thing they're going to do is, or among the first things they're going to do after, if they haven't heard of your company, they'll Google your company, but then they're going to search LinkedIn for you. Absolutely. And so if they come to your profile and they see that you, as you said, let's say you're posting, you curated, let's say just the top five resources you saw, information, you know, top five articles of the week, your opinion only, 
but you don't have to write anything. You just post those to your, as you said, to LinkedIn. Holy cow. You know, that's, it, they're saying, like, this guy can add something, or this woman or this guy can add something to what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, your LinkedIn profile or any other social profile, but LinkedIn profile is either a boring resume online um, or it can be a dynamic multimedia landing page. And, I, and that's the other part is that, you know, by cr creating and curating great content on your LinkedIn profile and your social profiles, when somebody Googles your name, you think about marketing and landing pages, and we've all been to them, where we get an or you know, we, we get a an offer, we click through, and we land on this well put together page that's designed to convert us to a customer or get our email address. Well, as a sales professional, your LinkedIn profile is largely your landing page, and so what is that really educating them on who you are, what your business is about, where your insights are, you know, or is it just another boring resume? And so I think that you know that that like as you related to the, the creation and curation aspect is really really key there. Yeah, and I think it's really a great point you made about their profile, and and maybe another way to to phrase it for you know salespeople or managers that are listening and thinking about this with their salespeople is that if you have a LinkedIn profile, you're social selling whether you're doing anything proactive or not, right? Because someone's going to look you up. Yeah, you're either you're either I think you're either contributing or detracting from the interaction, whether you realize it or not. Lack exactly. of lack of social media activity or profiles is also a statement. It is it is also a branding statement, and yes. it's it, it it raises a bunch of questions when you can't find someone on the internet or they haven't been bothered to update their photo in seven years. You know that that says something <laughs> to me um, if I want to do business with you. Right. Well, we're gonna come back and talk about that. And really talk about one of the other C's, which is commitment, because once you start this process, you start committing yourself to keep it going. Because to me, it's always a red flag when I'm talking to a potential vendor of things to me is if I go to their website and they haven't blogged in two years, you know, that they've been active and suddenly they have nothing new in two years. It's like, well, hey, what's going on here? Yeah, you know, it's like a red flag. Yeah, right. consistency is is really really key, and it, and I think that that is even just consistency of follow up is I think we can get all excited about the number of leads we add to our database, but if you you only interact with them the hot ones, uh, and you let the less rest fall off because they're not willing to sign a contract right away, or you intermittently or inconsistently follow up by email or LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, you just don't have enough consistent exposure. To really convert them and gain that mind share. There's no momentum. There's no relationships are all about momentum, right? It's about adding value with frequent contact over time. And so when I talk think about commitment, um, you know, it's sort of a non-sales example, but it but it's a it's a one guy show it was Gary Vaynerchuk who started Wine Library TV. Mm -hmm. And everybody everybody calls him, you know, a lot of people call him like this overnight success. But the reality is, is that he video blogged five days a week until he had video 148 and then that one kept going and, and that one like blew up and it really really made a difference in his business and it, you know and that kind of meteoric rise that viral rise was wasn't just a one hit wonder he actually had a a follow up to that so he had a consistent commitment that no matter what he kept going so he did his show again the next week and the next week and it was part of a greater strategy but the key was he was willing to do it until he cracked the formula and, and you know, a traditional sales stat, 81% of all the time you convert a competitor's client, it's going to happen after 5 to 12 value-added contacts and interactions. And so when I talk about commitment as a social sales professional, it's not about saying hello once on Twitter or connecting on LinkedIn and sending him like a pitch two weeks later, which is a really sad behavior I see on a regular basis. <laughs> it's like you've given up hope. On actually, actually, it's, it's more about within... 30 seconds, right? If somebody else sends you a connection request. And yeah, the like... smart ones will wait two weeks and then spam you. <laughs> yeah. but, 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 you know, but, but really, um, you know, where is the value-added contact in that? And so, but there's a commitment on follow-through because it, you'll be amazed um, at as you create presence and build relationships and connect and interact with people and build your community and share great content or create great content um, as a sales professional, you'll be amazed at the amount of payoff you'll get on that behavior, not just like right away. You'll get some right away successes, but even when you forgot you did this stuff, two years later, people will come out of the woodwork. And it's amazing to see how these relationships, you plant these seeds online, and if you do nurture them, um, they'll come to fruition. It's all, You almost can't stop it once it starts, right. you know, once you build that momentum. 
Excellent. Okay, we're going to take a short break. Now, before we go, though, I'm going to pose a hypothetical scenario to you, one that I pose to all my guests. So we'll get your answer after the break. So here's the scenario. You've just been hired as a new sales manager at a company whose sales have stalled out and desperately need to be turned around. Senior management's looking to you to have a big impact. So what are the two things you do the first week on the job that would have the biggest impact? So think about that. And we'll take your answer after the break. I'm going back with my guest, Shane Gibson, as we talk more about his nine C's of social selling success. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. Welcome back. My guest today is Shane Gibson. The question before the break was, Yes, um, I've got, I'm a new sales manager in an organization, the team is stalled. Results are stalled. Team is stalled. stalled. And what were the two things I would do? The first week that would have the biggest impact. I think the first week, if I was to look at, there's a number. There's so many areas you can approach this, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you get got, you get two. I got two. Either you have to come so, back for a second episode. But let's start with two. Okay. So the first one, number one, um, is I would dig down and see how well. I've got a process called targeting the right clients. Uh, I say I, it's something that was actually created by my father and mentor years ago. But it really helps people break down. I, I would walk them through that process and really it's it's based upon the Pareto principle that 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of your clients and target market. And I would go through the last 100 clients I interacted with <clears throat> and audit it and see how many of those 100 were actually 20 percenters or A's. Um, and I would take that team immediately within their contact and database and mandate that they only focus on their A's right now, the ones that are the high value, high opportunities. Um, the second thing that I would do uh, with that team, and this is hard because this is a bit of a hypothetical and thinking what industry they're in, what's the next step, um, is I would break down their sales process to daily disciplines. I find when most teams stall or it's lack of results, it can be broken down to the daily disciplines. So what is their what is their proactive time like? Are they highly reactive? Are they focused on their A's? Are they in a bunch of meetings? Are they reacting to the phone? Are they calling their list A through Z? Or are they truly focused in a proactive fashion? And so those two big things, getting them to focus on the 20% it's going to get them 80% of their results. And then putting a daily discipline plan in place that's highly proactive um, is the next step. And those would be the two big ones that I find uh, for sales organizations that I've worked with over the years that surprisingly, no matter how big and well-established the organization is, you'd be surprised how many people are indiscriminate about who they're calling, contacting, and interacting with on a daily basis. Yeah, and, and I think yeah, and I think one of the, the key things, and I, I use a different term for it, but... As you said, even companies that have been in business for a long time, it's, they lose the recipe, right? They, they, at one point, they were doing something that was really making them successful, enabling them to grow, and then you know, certain distractions set in, or they lose their focus a little bit, and they lose the recipe. Yeah, and they do, and, and, I, and I think that you know, the reason why I would be in there as a new sales manager is, that, is the first thing I would do if I was an advisor is probably get them to fire the sales manager. <laughs> uh, and because they look, the, you know, we look at all the studies um, at the Gallup, the big study by Gallup um, years ago on, on um, or that book, Phrase, First Break All the Rules and um, Now Discover Your Strengths was the other book by Marcus Buckingham. They talk about right. the fact that the single biggest impact on the performance of an employee is there is impacted by the the environment and the interaction um, created um, by their manager, their immediate manager, and so to me, you know what? Uh, in most cases, the lack of performance on that team. If I have like two or three bad performers, and I've got ten team players, maybe that manager needs a bit of coaching around how to deal with non-compliant or non-performing team members. They need some help. But when all ten are missing the missing the mark, either it's a HR travesty. 
or the leadership isn't happening from immediate management. In right. My yeah. Good. Excellent answer. An excellent answer. So let's go back to the nine C's of social selling. So another one that we talked about, they're sort of following up to curation is then creation. And this yeah. is, this seems a bit more problematic for me because you mentioned before is, you know, most sales reps aren't going to sit down and write a blog post. So what do you mean by creation for an individual sales rep involved in social selling? Well, you move from, I think, resource to thought leader in your industry vertical. And it's really up to you. I mean, not all people are going to be comfortable at right away. And this is why you need to educate yourself. You need to form your own opinions. You need to be great at curating. You need to, you need to live, breathe, and eat your industry. And I think at some point, you're going to have formed enough valid opinion, have enough experience with your clients that you're going to be able to start to share some of these insights. So I did a blog post recently and a podcast actually on influencer outreach. Where did that come from? It actually came from a proposal I write, wrote for a client. I didn't get the deal actually, that particular client. But I thought, wow, this first page of this proposal is actually a great blog post. I just need to change it a bit and dress it up. But it, it, you know, it states the, the need for influencer outreach, the steps you need to take, has some great stats in it. You know what? I'm going to repurpose that. So you'd be surprised as a sales professional how much you could actually repurpose from your day to day. How about how about the top 20 questions your clients constantly ask you about your industry? Well, there's there's your first 20 blog posts, and you probably have already written those emails to those clients. If you're not comfortable with email, you know what? Maybe you want to just you know put your iPhone or your Android, lean it up against a cup at your desk horizontally, not vertically, <laughs> and uh, and you know what? Talk to the answer a 30 second question about your industry. Start your YouTube channel or, you know what, cut it down to 15 seconds and uh, get it up on Instagram and then share that into Facebook. But the key here is that, you know, no matter, depending on what you're comfortable with, is that it, it actually, once you get in the habit, creating content's not that difficult. Um, and so it doesn't have to be a white paper that's 18 pages long. It could be 200 words. And again, back to, you could just create a blog post about the top 10 resources you found that week. Start with that. And then maybe on Fridays. And then on Mondays, you could do, you know what, question of the week, where you're actually answering customer questions on your blog. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is something, you know, that it could be something that simple. And you also, when I talk about creation, uh, you could also just create events or pull people together. So when I say create, it's about creating an experience. So for instance, maybe you create um, an industry networking event. You're in the insurance business and maybe you're a you actually work for the underwriter and there's you know 300 independent brokers in your city. So you know what? You, you have a monthly lunch and learn for brokers and you bring in industry experts um, who are doing really great uh, in the industry and share and you just host it. But by doing this, what have you created? You've created content. Uh, you could record that. You could pay someone to actually uh, develop a transcript off the audio, and you could repurpose that for the net. There's all kinds of ways you can get creative with content creation. Um, you can also, in many cases, your marketing team um, has all kinds of great content. Um, I think about Ford Motor Company. If you're a Ford salesperson, Ford Motor Company puts out like hundreds of blog posts a month on various aspects of owning vehicles, fleet leasing, and you name it, it wouldn't take very much to take two or three of those blog posts, pick the highlights, um, rework it, um, and create some content out of what your marketing team's already provided. And so, you know, this is this is something that you know is I believe is easy. You don't have to do it every day, but you know what? One or two nice pieces of content up on your LinkedIn profile every month. Um, along with um, pulling people together for offline events, for instance, or even organizing a webinar. These are all examples of content creation. Yeah, and you, so, gave, a, you gave a great example of one that really, should be really easy for salespeople to do. As you said, make a list of the top 20 questions you get from your prospects. And each one could be just a short blog post. You, know, you don't have to write a chapter. Right, yeah. write, write the outline. Write the outline. Pull all the stats together. Um, and if you have to, you know what? You might want to hire a writer to do it. And, you know, I know um, years ago when my father started off in radio sales, he was a top radio sales guy. But when he first started off, he hit the wall where he was making a ton of revenues. He was already the top guy at his station. And he went to his boss and said, look, all this admin work is killing me, right? And he said, you know, how do I how do I get around this? And they said, well, we don't have budget to hire an assistant. So he said, well, can I pay for it myself? I know it sounds crazy, but he's, they said, do you want to pay for your own assistant? And he said, absolutely. So he hired his own personal assistant. They came in and worked two, three days a week. That person took a ton of work off his table that wasn't about selling. And he went out and doubled his revenues again. 
And so why I share that story is a lot of salespeople don't look at themselves as business owners. And so they're like, oh, why should I invest in a writer? Or why should I invest in content creation? Because you know what? If you even if you've got the great concept and you don't want to create content fully on your own, maybe partner with someone to do it for you, pay a bit of money. But that could double your business. If you can increase your online footprint and establish yourself as a thought leader, I think that can go a long way. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, invest in yourself just to learn how to do some of these things. I mean, that is a huge investment that's gonna have major payback for you if you're in sales. You're if you're not tech literate as a sales professional. If you're retiring in the next four years, I would say don't worry about it. <laughs> but, but if you expect to be in sales or business in the for the next ten to twenty years, and you're not fully tech literate, you know what? Educate yourself. You, you can avoid and hide it from it a little bit, but it's going to catch up to you. And uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna be outpaced by the people who are fluid with using these tools. Yeah, I agree. All right, we're gonna move into the last segment of the show. We'll let after we finish this segment, you're gonna give people some information about how they can find out more about the remaining nine C's that we didn't get a chance to talk about here today. But now we're gonna move into some rapid fire questions and answers. Are you ready? Great. So what's the most powerful sales tool in your arsenal? The most powerful sales tool in my arsenal is face to face meetings. So I believe that the power of social selling or social media for many of us is the ability to use the internet to get off the internet. And so this is my attraction tool, but face to face meetings or at least on the telephone, those two things are really what helps me close business and build relationships. So that's the most powerful tool in my kit still after all these years. Yeah, and I like that phrase. I just was writing it down as you were speaking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, expro- yeah, use, I'm gonna expropriate use, it and use it somewhere else. <laughs> I, I, don't be mad when Scott Heiferman from Meetup.com sues you because that's where I got it. Um, is uh, his whole thing was the essence of Meetup was to build community by using the internet to get off the internet. I just and love, I love like, that. That's great. And because it's so, it's like, oh, I've got all these likes and look at my internet dashboard. I've got so many retweets. And my question is, how many of these people have you talked to this week? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because that, that's, that's how many people have you moved from step one to step three in your sales funnel this week? That takes FaceTime in many cases, or at least phone time. Yep. Right. Well, I love that. Excellent. Okay. Second question. Name the one tool you use for sales management that you can't live without. Sales management, sales management, uh, managing my sales process. Yes. Nimble, Nimble CRM. Um, Nimble is a social CRM and it does so much for me that if I had to organize it on myself, I'd be dead in the water. There's no way I could manage 5,500, getting close to now 6,000 LinkedIn connections and 3,000 Facebook connections and 30,000 Twitter connections and all my clients and interactions and trying to keep up with their social feeds. I'd have to have like 32 tabs open on two different screens. and uh, But instead, Nimble is great because I can look up Andy Paul and I can see all of your recent tweets and your Facebook updates and I can look at our last 10 interactions and I know what my next step is with you. And I can click through on your company name and see who else in your company, what they're up to. And it organizes your social really well and pushes it into a sales process for me. So it's a, it's a really great tool. And that's that's my my go-to tool. Um, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to add one more because I've integrated them is I use Hootsuite plugged into Nimble and Hootsuite schedules all my tweets for me. Um, It helps me track influencers. Um, I can even plan social media campaigns as a sales professional through that dashboard. So those two tools like bundled together are what I spend like 50% of my screen time on when I'm marketing or selling. Okay, excellent. Well, John Ferrara will appreciate the plug. Absolutely. He's the CEO of Nimble, and he's also a guest on an upcoming episode in the show. So, Fantastic. Who's your sales role model? My dad. Uh, my dad is uh, truly the best salesperson I've met uh, in my life, and I've worked with a lot of salespeople. Um, a close second is a friend of mine, Aminto Roy, who could sell you anything. And uh, but my father is was a real so, uh, role model for me in sales, and that's the one thing he taught me. I wanted to get in the speaking business, and I said, "Dad, I want to do what you do." He says, "Well, what do you do?" And I was about sixteen years old, and I was sixteen years old, and I said, "Well, you get on stage, you, you get to share this information. Uh, people love you. Uh, it looks awesome. You know, you get to change people's lives." He goes, "That's not what I do. He goes, that's my product." He said, what I do is I sell and I market. And he said, if you really want to do this business, then come work with me, 
and I'll sit you down beside, you know, Dennis Covier, who's, you know, um, another top author and friend of mine, and uh, you'll learn how to sell. And, uh, and so that's how I got started in the business. I got started in the speaking and training business, selling speaking and training. And, uh, you know, my father, he's one of the few guys I've seen who's closed numerous multi-million dollar training deals in his life. And so it's, uh, it's been pretty awesome to learn that art. And the big one for him um, is he's a big believer in this model he created. And it's time plus genuine assistance builds a relationship. And from that relationship builds a commitment from both parties, a commitment from you as a client to stay loyal to me and a commitment from me as a vendor to do the best absolute job I can for you. And that model is has been massive for me personally and for the clients that I've worked with. Excellent. Excellent. What's oh, the one? The way, at, Bill, at Bill Gibson one, at Bill Gibson one, like the number one mm -hmm. on Twitter if you want to follow him. All right. Excellent. To follow Shane Stad. Yep. So what's the one book that every salesperson should read? Oh, boy. That's a tough one. There's so many great books. Um, I liked your book, Amp Up Your Sales. That, oh, thank that, you. That was, that was a great book. That would be like on my list of top ten. Um, you know what I liked? Um, it's an old book, but it's a, very, it's a bestseller. It's not like old, old. Um, is uh, is called... Um, Selling the Invisible. Yeah, yeah, I've read that. Selling the Invisible is an absolute exceptional book, especially if you're selling intangibles. Yes, which very is good book. Space thing. That's a, it's a fantastic book. That really changed the way I sell. And you know what? The other one which I really enjoyed was, um, and it, you know, it, it's called Selling the Vito by Anthony Perinello, and yes. it's, a, it's a classic book. And Vito, V I T O. Um, that really helped me around for and my just, own business. That's for people decision. listening. That's very important. Top officer. Yes. Yeah. yeah not, absolutely. not just selling to somebody named Vito, right? And then, you know what? I, boy, after that, um, there's so many, you know, fantastic books on sell sales out there. Um, I'm trying to think of my, some of my other, other ones, um, you know, stuff from Jeff Gittimer. I like it. Mm -hmm. his, his mm -hmm. stuff. It's great. I, I think his stuff is, you know, and, and I hope he doesn't get offended by this. If he hears his podcast, I find his stuff is really well geared towards people who are in, you know, transactional level selling, um, you know, and then mm -hmm. if you move, if you move into larger sales, the book, uh, Mastering the Complex Sale is a fantastic book as well. Yeah, Jeff and Thule. Jeff Thule. And that, so those, those are kind of a few that, that I enjoy, um, you know, and that I think are, are really relevant um, in this, uh, this time. Now, um, a classic which is a really great book, uh, which I think was written in the 1920s, is How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. Frank Becker. Yes, and that is like a classic. That that one I like. And then, of course, one more is How to Win <laughs> Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Okay, good. All right, we're going to cut you off at that point. But all, all, <laughs> all, all, all good choices, though. Sorry about that. I no problem. No problem. So... What's your here now? This is this is the hardest question of the day. So, what's your favorite music to listen to to sort of get yourself pumped up? Oh boy, my favorite music. Oh boy, um, it's not heavy metal. Um, I actually they get pumped up. It depends upon like what situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually, I like like I literally if I'm like running or doing athletics, I'll put on hip hop and rap and, you know, and let it go, you know, and, uh, it just pumps me up. It gets me in the zone. Um, so a little Eminem, uh, you know, lose yourself. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an awesome song. And it's, it's actually, you know, it works for a lot of us who are in the ring and, and going for the brass ring. Um, but on the other side, uh, probably, uh, if you're an American listener, you might not know them, uh, as a little known Canadian, a well-known Canadian folk band, um, called spirit of the West. And I really enjoy them. If you're part of the, the you know the maritime culture um you'll enjoy those guys and that's a feel good get me in a good positive mood oh good uh, okay spirit of the west i'll have to write yeah. that down and, and make sure i listen to that spirit of the west home for a rest that's i think their biggest song <laughs> all right so we yeah. got that on so what's the first sales activity you do every day first sales activity i do every day um you know and it's something that i could probably reevaluate. Um, is first sales <laughs> sales activity I do every day is I go on my social media channels and I check for urgence and I start my social media monitoring. Has someone mentioned my brand? 
has someone cursed at me because my book didn't arrive? You know, sure. <laughs> so it's kind of my monitoring to see what's immediately happening. Um, and the next thing um, I'll, I'll typically do um, is I like to schedule my sales calls um, in the morning uh, when, I've, when I'm high energy, when I've got my most energy. And so the next thing I'll do is I'll hit my, my sales calls. Um, and then from that process, um, after I'm done my sales calls and I'm all fired up, um, I'll typically, um, you know, lunchtime because I, I work out of a home office now. I used to have an office downtown and I've gotten more and more virtual over time and enjoy the flexibility. Um, I'll, I'll spend research time around lunch and teaching myself and learning online. Okay. Um, and that's kind of what I do. So it's pretty simple, but it's just, it's check my social destinations for, um, and you know, and I already know what I'm doing for the day. Like the night before, I, this is the trick question actually, because or trick answer, because the night before I typically plan my day. Right. Um, and then I get up and I, I hit the list. Um, but the first thing is, is anybody needing me? Cause I believe the power of social is in the speed of response. So I won't be on there all day, but I'm going to check it, you know, first thing in the morning around lunchtime and in the afternoon to make sure that I get back to the people connected with me. And I find if you can respond quickly, you're going to get a much higher lift in engagement with the people connected to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what my first book, Zero Time Selling, was all about. So last question for you. What's the one question you get most, excuse me, what's the one question you get asked most frequently by salespeople? You know, I think right now the topic of LinkedIn, believe it or not, if when as soon as they know I'm a social selling guy, they go, and it's almost like they confess to me. They're like, I'm on LinkedIn, but I know I'm not using it well. <laughs> like, what should I do? And that's the question. It's and, like, I'm on it. I know I'm not using it well. What should I do? And what's the answer? Briefly. Uh, yeah, the first, I, I, yeah, you're getting to know me. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first, the first step is um, maximize your profile. So make sure that you know it's optimized for keywords. Make sure you're using rich media. You got presentations embedded. You've, written, you've listed your whole history, so that when people hit it, it actually sells for you. Excellent. Um, you know, and then the second thing for me is I usually set it up is that you know we set it up like the gym. The gym won't work if you don't go in at least you know a few times a week. And, and you don't have to be in there an hour a day, but you know what, 20 minutes a day even will help. And so the goal is to help them set them up so they're in there 20 minutes a day, curating great content and making new connections and having good conversations. And it's simple, but so few of them, they just create their profile and then sit there and stare at it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, great. Well, Shane, I appreciate you taking the time to join me today. It's been awesome to be on the show. Tell people how they can find out more about you. Best way to find me is closingbigger.net is my blog and site. You're going to find my blog posts. You're going to find a link to my iTunes podcast. You can also search for Shane Gibson podcast on iTunes to find me. And you can follow me on Twitter at Shane Gibson. Okay, excellent. And all those links will be on the show notes page for this particular episode on my website at andypaul.com. So again, that's Shane. Thanks for joining me. And remember, Thank friends, you, yeah, remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. Subscribing to this podcast is an easy way to do that because then you'll make sure you don't miss any of our conversations with top business experts like our guest today, Shane Gibson, who share their experience and expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining us. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.